how come we separate verse 16 from the rest of the chapter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Moses, okay. get it. In 14, mm -hmm. it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and uh -huh. rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart uh -huh. because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Okay. Then he gives them the command. I mean, it's the only thing that makes sense to me. It may not be right, but he gives them the command to go and preach, and he who believes and is baptized will be saved, blah, 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 blah. Mm hmm. Now, now I think he goes back to speaking to them uh -huh. in, re in, in, re in reference to the fact that they didn't believe and he's always been dealing with them and their tendency to have unbelief mm -hmm. and lack of faith. So, now these signs will follow up. You guys, you guys who don't have belief. There we go. If you believe uh -huh. in my name, those of you who believe uh -huh. in my name, they will cast out demons. They will blah, 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 blah. So we go back up to verse 14, and we see that he's talking with who? The 11. The 11. The 11. So he's talking with the 11. And he says, these signs will accompany them that believe. believe. And he's speaking to who? The 11. To the 11. In my name. Now here's what we see in the scripture. Paul was snake bit. And he brushed, right you know, right, dropped it right in the fire. Kept on going like, wasn't nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. Now mind you, today we got some faith healers. You know what's interesting about faith healers? If you walk up to them with a, with a glass of strychnine, rat poison, I, I'm good, bro. Well, hold up, bro. If you touch him and heal him, how come faith healers ain't in the hospitals? Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah, right. But, but it, it just makes sense. Well, there's not enough faith in the house. There's some Christians in the hospital, too. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But we have to examine who he's speaking to. And he says, these signs will accompany you as you go out and you do these things. Sure enough, they went out and they did all of those things. But what we understand when we examine the whole biblical narrative Every time it came to passing on miraculous gifts or signs, there was an end. The only people who could do it were the apostles. So as we examine the biblical record, when it was Peter and John, they went over to Samaria to see what was going on over there. Oh, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, but they didn't receive the miraculous gifts of the Holy Ghost. So they prayed and then they laid hands. Come on about your business. Paul came, he laid hands. Go on about your business. But when the apostles passed away, that ability to transfer the gifts of the Holy Spirit died with them. So now we go when individuals say that they are apostles today. And hear me when I say this. Because there are, within the scriptures, when you get to Acts, there are two types of apostles. Don't crucify them. Hear me when I say this. There are the 12 who could pass on miraculous gifts, and then there were those who were sent with for specific purpose from this congregation to that congregation. It's not to say that there's a ranking of apostles. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right, if it doesn't, we can explain it real quick. Make sense? Hold it up. Y'all looking at me funny. I'm starting to sweat in the first five minutes. You do have individuals that believe today that they are an apostle after the 12. Yeah. And the yeah. thing about it is, for them, Acts chapter 1 kind of states what the qualifications are. They had to be with us since the baptism of John all the way up. And it was only two of them at that time. Paul was one born out of due season in Christ showed you. Number of things. So he would say, for I received of the Lord, of the Lord, that which I delivered to you. So Christ showed him these things. Well, well, we got apostles now that claim that they're apostles now after the order of the twelve, that they, they have the miraculous gifts. You know, 
I ain't, ain't going to say that because you know what the joke is. But listen, if you're on a pop side of that order, you are something we've never seen because we ain't never seen a 2,000-year-old person. Say that again. Well, we all know where John died. It could have been Jerusalem, it could have been near Jerusalem, but we're not exactly sure where John died. As a matter of fact, Peter was crucified upside down. This is something that, that, that I'm going to say, and I ain't scared to say it. It is always, I've always found it funny, the Vatican, the city-state that's over there, the Vatican states that underneath it are buried the crypts or the tombs of Peter and Paul. And the problem with that is uh, when you crucify somebody, because Peter was crucified, he was crucified upside down. History tells us this. But when you crucify somebody, when they get the body after it, it's discarded in a mass grave with whomever else was crucified. So it wasn't until 325 AD that there was the, no, 313 AD, there was an edict of tolerance where Christians were tolerated. He, Peter, probably died, I can't remember the exact date, he died somewhere between, what is it, 87, no, 8066, in A.D. 80, somewhere in that range, he died. So somehow you went back to this time and said, wait a minute, those bones are glowing, those got to be Peter. Yeah. And you came and you buried it here. Peter, Paul, was beheaded as a criminal. So his body was also discarded. So you went back, he died right after he wrote the second epistle to Timothy, because if I'm correct, he wrote 1 Timothy, Titus, and no, he wrote Titus, but anyway. And then he writes 2 Timothy, and that's why he said, the time of my departure is at hand. And he says, Peter says the same thing at the end of it, and they both were killed. So who is under? I believe his bones under the Vatican, but who is it? We don't know. But individuals are claiming a lot of things, and it's like, well, hold up, if we go back and we really look at some things, wait a minute. You cannot say the church started in Rome when Christ said, get to Jerusalem. And when you get to Jerusalem, there you will be my witnesses. So how did we end up in Rome? There's a, there's a lot of funny stuff. A lot of funny business. There's a lot of funny business. And when you start to look at it, you say, hold up. Wait a minute. Well, we were looking at this book called the Didache, the Didache, or the, the uh, uh, Acts of the Twelve Apostles, which is, you can actually find this book today. The Didache says that Peter and Paul, they both started a congregation in Rome. No, they didn't. Because Rome, because Paul at the end of his letter was like, I hope to get over there. Don't look like it's going to be too soon, but I hope to get over there. <laughs> and then he was dead. So how? <laughs> when he went to Rome, he was beheaded. So how? Well, there's a lot of things that uh, the Didache is also considered uh, a, 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 not a joke, but a, not a false book. It's not inspired at all. Um, there's a lot of things that go directly in the Didache that go directly against the gospel. We need to say. I started to go somewhere with this. We must consider rule number two. So whom, who's being spoken to? Amen? <sighs> yes. We must see if the command or statement is for us to obey today. Certain scriptures were designed for certain groups or individuals like the one we just saw in Mark, amen? amen. Genesis 6, 14 and following was spoken to Noah, is not for us today. Genesis 22, 1 and 2 was spoken to Abraham, is not for us today. Uh, Exodus 20 and 8 was given to the Israelites, it's not for us today. Some passages that were applied to the apostles like we just looked at were not for us today. And some passages are for alien sinners to obey, like Acts 2 and 38. Amen? Mm -hmm. Rule number three is to observe who's doing the talking. Makes sense, right? 
We're going to find out who's being spoken to. Who's speaking? So that we can grasp and understand what is being said. Uh, the Bible says, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Now the question is, who said it? Because if we say, well, that's in the Bible. Yeah, but who said it? Job chapter 2, verse number 4. Oh, Chapter 2, verse number 4, the Bible says. <laughs> Who said it? Satan. Who said it? Satan. Satan said it. Satan answered the Lord, and he said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Is that something we need to follow? <laughs> uh, somebody said, well, the Bible says it. No, 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 no. The Bible says it, but it's Satan who said it. Mm. It's true Satan said it, but it's a false statement. Job is an example that proved it was a false statement. Amen. Mm. Paul was an example that proved it was a false statement, 2 Timothy 4 and following, uh, 6 and following. Uh, Job's wife said, does thou still retain thine integrity, curse God, and die? Well, if I say, you know, the Bible says, does thou shall retain thy integrity, curse God, and die? I was like, well, you know, the Bible says that, yeah, but it wasn't, it was, it was, it was Job's crazy wife that said it. I mean, she said it, God didn't say it. Oh, okay. Oh man. How about this? You shall not surely die. Hmm. See? The serpent said it, Eve, you shall not surely die. True statement, but he told a lie. As I've said earlier, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, verse number 1. We see it all the time that if we don't give heed to who's being spoken to or who actually said it, we can lead ourselves into some serious trouble. Matthew, well, yeah, we already got this thing here. The fourth rule, and we've been talking about context, context, context. Respect for the, we have to respect the setting of the text. Respect the setting of the text. The reason we say respect the setting is because if we don't respect the setting, we find ourselves in some serious issue. Amen? Uh, there was oh, 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 hold up. There was an example. Uh, there are several examples. We must not take a passage out of its context. I've said it over and over and make, over and over again. Uh, in real estate, there are three rules. What's the rules? Location, location, location. location. Coming to study in God's word is context, context, context. Ah. <laughs> I don't want to go there because that's another Bible study for another day. That can uh, we get into an all of a sudden an explosion. Uh, but some say you can't go there anyway. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Go to Matthew chapter 24, if y'all don't mind. Matthew chapter 24, we look at verses briefly. Matthew chapter 24. Oh, man. Matthew chapter 24. This here is one of my favorite passages of scripture because, well, you will, we'll look and we'll see for a moment. In Matthew 24, we start at verse number one. The Bible says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not 
be torn down. As he was sitting, sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of the coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down and get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. And then there will, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved for the sake, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is Christ, and, or there he is, do not believe him. Mm, it's a long passage that I thought. Oh, no, it's not. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. <coughs> Wherever the corpse is, there will... There the vultures will gather, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on clouds of the sky with great power and glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. And then he says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branches, when its branches already become tender and puts forth fruit, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And most people will go to this and say, hold up, man. When all of these things take place, this will be a sign that God is coming for his world. And so sometimes when wars break out, people will say, God is coming for his world. It's coming soon. It's a war breaking out or a famine or a natural disaster that's tremendous take place. And they'll say, be careful. God is coming for his world. This is a sign. And then Jesus says in verse number 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows. <laughs> Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. He ain't talking. Why would the thief... Hey, just want to let you know, on Thursday I'm coming back here to rob you. I just want you to know, I'll holler at you later. Why would a thief... And that's what he gets into next. He says, what thief would tell... If the strong man knew when the thief was coming, he ain't gonna let nothing happen to his household. So sometimes, even within the church, we'll miss a verse. Take a whole bunch of this big chunk and say, oh man, he's talking about, now there's depth to what he's saying. There's depth to what he's saying. But is he saying that these are the signs of the things to come? 
when the Son of Man comes. Now he says, ain't nobody going to know that day. And then he gets deeper and says, hold up. It, it's going to be, it. the coming of the Lord is just going to be like the days of Noah. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them away. Listen, the flood is coming. The flood is coming. You got to see the typology. Old Testament, New Testament. I done went off somewhere. But the typology, Noah, the flood is coming. The flood is coming. The flood is coming. And then God said, Noah, get in the ark. He got in the ark. The ark was sealed up. And everybody, is it raining? Oh, this is raining more than usual. It's just, no, when did this, when did this, we need to get to the ark. Mm -hmm. Fast, fast approaching. Well, there's typology there, but I ain't getting it. But we must respect the setting of the context and where something is. And this is one of those passages that people will take and make say something that it doesn't. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Fifth rule. Fifth rule, and then we'll close it out for this evening. Fifth rule of study, do not construe one passage of scripture so that it contradicts another <coughs> passage of scripture. <coughs> Don't make one scripture against another scripture because God's word does not contradict itself. Amen? Any explanation of a passage of scripture that contradicts another passage of scripture is not an explanation at all. First example, Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 5, by grace ye are saved. To construe this passage to mean that we are saved by grace alone. Now, and that there are not conditions to meet. Well, no, no, no. Be able to phrase this thing here. Yeah. Grace is inclusive of obedience. Amen? Amen. God saved us by His grace, but access to it, He also wrote that demand as well. Amen? 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 Because unfortunately, and I realize one of the things we'll be off of here, uh, unfortunately, when it comes down to the, 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 the doctrine of grace, sometimes we in the church, we, we, we kind of don't want to talk about it. I can't go there right now. I could. I could, but I can't go there right now. But his grace does not eliminate obedience. Amen? We all agree with that. God did what we could not do. So, I got to go there. <clears throat> How many of us were baptized? That's, that's all of us, right? Uh, most of us, all of us. Yeah, you weren't baptized yet. Yeah. And you were like, yeah, it was me too. I don't want We were all baptized. Now, here's the one thing that there are those in the world that will say baptism is a work. Baptism is a work. Uh, anybody in here believe baptism is a work? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Ba baptism yeah. is a work. Yeah. Whose work is it? It's God's work. Mm -hmm. We obey him, he goes to work. Unless you are born of the water and the spirit. There's no way we go in the water and all of a sudden we initiate the spiritual operation as God working on us. Amen? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this I mean to say. Unfortunately, there are those who will say, well, if we don't, no. He said what access to it is. He said in the Old Testament, listen, Moses, build the bronze serpent. If they don't look at it, they won't be healed. So in order for them to be healed, when they get built by a fire serpent, they have to look up at the serpent in order to be healed. Were they healed because they looked? <laughs> this is what a complicated question. Were they healed because they looked, or when they looked, did God go to work on them? When they looked, God went to work on them. So, yeah, do, you, do you follow the logic there? Kathy, you got your head over your face. Did I confuse you? Okay, cool. cool. I just want to make sure. Uh, another example. Paul said, hmm, Therefore, 
being justified by faith. To construe that this passage means that we are saved by belief alone. To say that we're, we are saved by belief alone. This is Romans 5 and 1. Without meeting what faith really means in total. Which is obedience is to, it's the mess of the scripture. Does that make sense? We do have individuals in the world today that are teaching. Listen, the only way for you to be saved is by faith and faith alone. Might I drop something? Might I drop something on you? How is it? <clears throat> yeah, five minutes. But how is it that in our society today, we can look at Scripture and see a word of Scripture and pull it completely apart from its biblical definition. Because faith has another word in there, in the scripture. Faithfulness. So if faith is belief only, then what is faithfulness? Y'all follow that? Does that make sense? Go back there again. Huh? Go back there again. Say, so go back there again. Yeah. If we say that faith in the scripture is only belief then how do we explain faithfulness it's 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 not the the, the um maybe the, the the verb form what is that it's not, it's not the verb form the verb the verb form the, yeah well, it, what part of speech would be verb or adjective it would in Faithfulness, that would be, well, faithfulness would be a noun. Being faithful would be the verb. Having faith would also be a noun. Oh, yeah, okay, so faith is the noun. Faithfulness would also be the noun part. Mm -hmm. um, and then what was the question? I forgot. So, <laughs> so, so, so the, the, the reason. <laughs> The reason I, I, I go there is to, to state, as we say, this rule, don't construe it or don't mess it up so that it goes against what the Bible says. When we deal with faith, faith in the scripture is inclusive of several things. One thing overall. Faith at its basis, I think I've done the, the triangle, the pyramid with you before. Faith at its base is belief. Based on that belief, we trust. And based on that truth, we owe, or that trust, we obey. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the scripture? He said so. going through something in my head uh, because there's a passage of scripture I want to point to that actually kind of brings this thought out. Faith, biblical faith, and this is understanding the context of the word. Biblical faith. Uh, the Bible will say, that's it. Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, that's the scripture I'm looking for. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in jail. And they are in jail. Somebody said it was a riot that started. They got mistreated. They got thrown in jail. They are in a bad situation. And they are at midnight. They started singing praises to the Lord. And then an earthquake came and shook it. And all the jail cells were open. And the massive Philippian jailer. He's, he's about to fall on his sword, and Peter and Paul says, Now, nah, wait, 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 we're all still in our cells. And the jailer comes to him and says, What must I do to be saved? So when we get down to verse 30, which is where he says it, in verse 31, Paul says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, he said... Belief. That's what he said, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. He said, belief. He
He says belief, but let's go a little further into the text. In verse 32, it says, And they, Paul and Silas, spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. So we understand they left, went to his house. And they spoke the word to him and to everybody in his household. Y'all following along in the scripture with me? And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. It would seem that they said, believe on the Lord and you will be saved. But they ended up listening to the word and then being baptized. Well, let's dig a little bit further. Not 34, we have 33 to learn how to baptize in his household. And he rejoiced, he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Well, hold on. We, got, we, we, we have an issue. Not an issue. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus. You and your household and you will be saved. Then the jailer washes Paul and Silas and then he and his household are baptized. And then everybody has joy because what does the Bible say? They believed in God, or he believed in God with his whole household. So the question is, what is believing being equated with? Obedience. Obedience. How were they obedient? In the scripture it says that they were what? Baptized. They were baptized. So they obeyed the word because they heard it. He said, believe on the Lord, you and your household, and you will be saved. It's a synecdoche. He's giving a part for the whole. He said, believe on the Lord, and you and your household, you will be saved. And then they heard the word, and then they were baptized. Mm -hmm. And they had joy because they believed that they, the whole household believed. Well, hold up. Is belief <laughs> left here? Or is belief a synecdoche? which deals with obedience. You follow what I'm saying? Sometimes in the scripture, if I pull just that verse out, verse, was that 30? Or 31? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and pull it out of its context. I made the Bible say something it didn't say. Amen? If I keep it in its context and then we examine the whole context, it was more to what happened. It wasn't just belief. Or belief in the context referenced the whole picture of obedience. Have I confused you enough? Everybody got it? Yeah, yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to stop confusing y'all now. Let me get some smiling. If you, if you leave, well, just... Well, well let, me, let me get some smiling. Well, they've got Uh huh. Uh, what is it, Romans? Um, Romans 10 17. Yeah. So the faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word right, of God. Right. Now, in that context, faith means belief. In the context here, believe means obedience. So he's talking about the whole thing, but he, Paul is only saying it in part. Believe on the Lord. He actually says it in Romans 10. Confession. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But that's the synecdoche. He's using a part for the whole thing. And if, you know, it's one of those words that, that, that Lord Jesus, because ain't nothing like sitting there studying with somebody and somebody say, well, Romans 10 and 10, and you just like, they say unto salvation. That means to the point of, prove it. Uh, I've been in that spot. But until you, but to understand this, 
there's, there's more to this whole thing when it comes to understanding the scripture. But we have to keep things in their context. Truth be told, I didn't have to get into the Greek to really prove what believing was in Acts 16. Amen? Because it says it right there. If we read deep into it. Let me get Mervyn, then we close out. Uh -oh. If you, if you, because I, I've seen it like this morning, I, I was listening. What you, what you, what you're saying right there? I was listening to that today, this morning, mm. uh, from somebody who was teaching on the television. But right? the, the whole thing, one of the, the thing that he was saying, and he left everything else out, and he said his his argument is all you got to do is believe. Mm -hmm. And once you say, once you believe, that you're saved. You see, the rest of the stuff he didn't throw in there. He just got to the baptism and all that stuff there that he didn't throw in there. Mm -hmm. And he's doing a whole lesson like what you're doing here, how to study the Bible. Right. I know what okay. you're talking about, yeah. All right. And what he's saying is that all you had to do is believe. That if you believe in, in Jesus, then you're saved. Hmm. So the repentance and the baptism and, and so it's, it's a whole nother thing. It, it's, as far as he's, can, he's saying is that all you got to do is believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he used a passage this morning, and maybe you, if you had time, maybe you could look at it. Maybe, maybe you could look at it another time. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 and to 14. He talks about entering into the straight gate, where wide is the way that leads to destruction. And, yeah. And, that, and, that. and then he was, he was exactly what you're doing there now. He was doing the same thing. He pulls them three, them from, from verse 12 to 14. Uh -huh. He pulls that together. And then he was saying here, go back and look at the context. What he's talking about. Enter into the straight gate. For, a while, for, for now is the way that leads to this. And, and few they will find. Mm -hmm. And his, 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 his thing is that if you go back and look at the context, he, 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 many of us, he said, use that passage for say that, like the sinner and going to hell. Mm -hmm. His argument is that if you go back and look at verse 12, where he pulls out from the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. So that's, that may be another thing for another time. And then, maybe, yeah. And, maybe. Okay, but I, when you look at what he's teaching, all, right, all about the repentance and the baptism and so he doesn't all his argument is that all you have to do is believe right and once you believe mm -hmm. you're saved That's his argument. okay there's a place that's not coming to me now but uh presented it uh where it says that the pharisees they love the praise of the uh they love the praise of men more than the praise of god and so they believe Christ, but they wouldn't confess it. You talk to most, most faith-only advocates, and they'll say, well, you got to confess Christ. But you said, if all we got to do is believe, then those Pharisees are saved. Hmm. We're saved. Wait a minute. So, I thought the whole way to do is believe, why we got to confess? <coughs> Lord, there's, there's, a, there's an argument there. We can get there. But we'll, we'll, we'll close it off here this evening. Good study. Amen.